Um, I think we've already sort of started um, at Mark Sims in talking about some of the issues and many of the <coughs> contemporary issues and debates that we have around the question of uh, women's uh, oppression and the struggle for the liberation of, of women. Um, but I'm going to be talking about um, a book that was written in 1884 uh, by Engels, um, uh, the collaborator of, uh, of, of uh, obviously of Karl Marx. Um, and um, the reason that I want to do that, we're going to do that really, is because um, the, the Engels has something to say that's actually very, very important to our understanding of, of, of women's oppression, how it came about, and therefore what we should do about it. And I think this is the big question, you know, first big question, can we end the oppression of women? And if we can, and hopefully we all hope that we can, um, the next question is how do we do this and what kind of struggle or movement uh, should that be? And I think that one of the key to, 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 to start to answer those sorts of questions is the, que the, is the question about what is the roots of women's oppression, what causes uh, women's, women's oppression. Um, and uh, in his book, um, The Origins of the Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State, um, Engels argued, uh, just to summarise it very quickly, that most, for most of human history, women have not been oppressed and that it was the rise of class society that was the root cause of what he called the world historic defeat of, of the female sex. And he argues, moreover, that the family as we know it now is not some unchanging institution and he says that it has a history and that history is rooted in the organisation of product basic, uh, the production of basic uh, human needs. Um, uh, so, you know, food, shelter, and so on. And this is actually, it was a controversial argument at the time, and I think actually it still it remains controversial argument today. And I think that what many people say, that Engels' method is a reductionist method, that the problem with what he argued, that rooting the, the, um, the oppression oppression of women in class society, he's accused of economic determinism. That's to say, people, people argue uh, that we can't just reduce women's oppression to the, these sorts of economic conditions, these economic uh, uh, circumstances, that we can't reduce the oppression of women to class. After all, all women across classes are, are oppressed, and, and, and that's true, and we know that, and I think that Engels knew that too. Um, Furthermore, people, you know, that we, we, we have the argument today, I think, that the, the, the domination of men, men, what might, some people might call patriarchy, has existed across all societies. Uh, and that, therefore, the argument runs, uh, and I think this is a very common argument that we have to take very seriously, that socialism is no guarantee of women's liberation and that, and that perhaps, therefore, some kind of separate struggle, separate from the struggle for women's liberation, uh, for, for struggle for socialism, separate from the class struggle, um, it is needed. And furthermore, the, um, Engels drew on the anthropological knowledge that he had at the time, uh, uh, it's a discipline that was really in its infancy, and again, that, uh, uh, that anthropology has also been contested, said to be out of date and so on, and I think what we will find is that, of course, some, some of what uh, Engels argued does have to be updated, we do know more now, but I want to carry on up to argue, ultimately, um, that uh, uh, that uh, Engels' main arguments and his, and his method, his historical materialist method, uh, stands up. And, um, uh, and so I think what I, I want to look, for, look at, therefore, is look at what he did argue, go through what his arguments were in the light of what we now know in the, in the view of, of, of current uh, uh, anthropological and uh, archaeological uh, knowledge. And what it does appear is that Engels actually basically got it right got it right both in his method and actually in the basic ideas of the development of class society and the roots of, of, of women's oppression. Um, so, Engels followed um, Morgan, Henry Lewis Morgan, uh, uh, one of the, the earliest sort of, uh, pioneer anthropologists of, of his time, he's an American man, um, he, he was not a, any kind of, he wasn't really a socialist, he wasn't a, you know, any sort of revolutionary, but nonetheless he had, uh, uh, he knew the Native Americans uh, 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 where he lived and he defended them, he defended their rights, he, he, he admired them and respected them. And he was also uh, an advocate of the equality of, of, of women. And what he, what Engels follows him really in many of his, his arguments that he made, uh, that for most of human history, which we now know to be about 150,000 years, um, we, um, we've lived in egalitarian societies, societies that are, uh, ha run a form of democracy, um, and sharing decisions, and that in those societies there was no oppression of women. 
um, what Eleanor Burke Leacock, who I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about later, called, which she talked about women's autonomy, the autonomy of women. Um, and so uh, uh, Morgan, and Engels follows Mor uh, Morgan in this, argued that the rise of class society in which uh, created a situation in which women <coughs> lost control over production and production decisions, and which a monogamous marriage was imposed on women, uh, monogamy ha which had not been there uh, uh, before. Um, Morgan also developed all sorts of ideas of kinship uh, systems in, in ancient societies, which I think um, had some very, very good points in it, but nonetheless also uh, uh, modern thinkers have um, updated those. Um, but in, in some, some, of, uh, some of his contentions, he was essentially right. He argued that um, in tradition, traditional uh, societies, descent was reckoned through the female rhyme, what he called mother right. In other words, today, you know, my, my surname is my father's name, um, in, a, in ancient societies, if, if we had a system like that, my surname would be my mother's name. That, um, and I'll go on to uh, exactly why that would be in a moment. Um, Engels also um, used the, uh, de, um, Morgan's uh, ideas of uh, stages of human social development. And now we know that these stages took place in different places at different times, but nonetheless there is a great deal, as we know now, a great deal of consistency about the way in which class societies have developed uh, in different, you know, different continents uh, at different points. Um, the terms that um, uh, Morgan used sound, I think, somewhat old-fashioned to us today, and we wouldn't use them, but I'll say them anyway and just say what, say what they are. He talked about savagery, um, I think what we would call hunter-gatherer today, um, societies where there's no class society. Um, and he then says the next stage of human development is barbarism, I think what we would call a horticultural or very early uh, agricultural societies, the first agricultural societies in which people started to settle down and, and domesticate plants and animals. And ultimately, actually in a way I find this the most questionable in a way, civilization, because <laughs> Civil we're supposed to be in civilization today as it happens, um, the, uh, the, the, the rise and final development of class society. Um, Probably the first first class societies arose uh, in, in uh, about five thousand years ago in the Middle East, um, and uh, so so the the uh, the, the, uh, the what would we call civilization? I would take issue with that point, but nonetheless, the, the rise of the class society, inequalities <coughs> in wealth, rise of the state. Um, the full development of agriculture, irrigation, cities, and, and, and so on. Uh, get, um, Engels gives the examples of you know, the classical uh, uh, Greek cities or, or uh, ancient Rome as examples of, of what, what he means. Another example would be the, 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 uh, the ancient, uh, the, the pharaoh societies of ancient Egypt. That would be another uh, example. Now, um, he do, uh, Engels, therefore, I said Morgan wasn't a, a, uh, wasn't a socialist. Engels, of course, was a, was a historical materialist Marxist. And he, so he wants, he's interested in these uh, ideas of development because he wants to start from a historical materialist approach to society. That's to say, the way in which we organize production rooted in uh, the, you know, if you like, the, the, uh, the, the state of technology um, alongside the, the, rela the relations that we enter into, the relationships that we enter into when we, when we engage in production, um, the, these, the, this combination of factors, um, what we might call the mode of production, uh, underlies all sorts of other relationships in society, and that includes uh, sexual relationships, you know, in other words, the most personal relationships that we enter into. It also ent um, uh, has an effect on the relationships that we enter into in the course of bringing up children, bringing up the next generation uh, of society. Society. And that's why he says that the family has a history that it's not some unchanging institution. Uh, the private family, separate from production that we know today, has not always existed. It's not some uh, sort of, uh, uh, long-standing entity and in, in the way that some, uh, some people would like us uh, uh, to, to believe. So then looking at the question of, of what, it, what then was the, the role of society, women in, in these uh, hunter-gatherer uh, uh, societies. I said they were egalitarian, I said that women were not oppressed, I said that um, uh, Engels supports the idea of dissent uh, is reckoned through the women, and there's a very good reason for that, because um, what we, what um, uh, Ellen Bur Eleanor Burke Leacock, um, the writer who, Marxist uh, writer who, who particularly lived with and uh, worked with the um, Montagnier Nascapi uh, Indians in, in, in Canada, 
what she what she saw was she talked about the autonomy of women, um, and that included their sexual autonomy. So whilst um, at least among the Montana and uh, Nascapi, they I think they had a basic idea of pairing sort of pairing sort of marriage. Nonetheless, there was a great deal of flexibility about this. First of all, the right to, to divorce was absolutely um, that, that that was absolutely fine. There was any either a man or a woman could initiate an, a divorce if they were not happy with each other. Uh, that um, and that this could. Um, you could, you could separate without um, losing out economically and without your children uh, suffering um, and without any um, um, social disapproval uh, of, any, of any sort. But also that within marriage, um, women also, you know, if you wanted to sleep with someone else, you could. Um, there wasn't, re you know, again, there's a great deal of flexibility about, um, uh, about ideas, about, about relationships and, 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 and so on in marriage. And again, Engels quotes um, the missionary, a man called Asher Wright, um, I mean, missionaries of all people, um, and a number of missionaries did describe uh, hunter-gatherer societies. And uh, he talks about he talked about women's power in the household. But again, let's be clear about what a household is. Uh, it's not you know a house like we have today, man, woman, two, two point five kids, dog and a cat, and so on. Um, it's um, uh, the household could be a, a long house, a house in which you know a number of uh, families uh, live live together, or a group of tents. And usually, these uh, tent, this, this, this grouping um, is is run and controlled by a senior woman. It's usually with with her with her daughters, and we find this again. We find this across across the world. Um, it's been described about the the people of the Kalahari, um, in in which on marriage, um, the, uh, the, on, the man would go to live with the woman in her in in with her and her mother, and he might well be asked to. Um, uh, uh, to give um, lots of gifts and, and meat and so on um, uh, for 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 uh, for his wife's mother, and you know he better do that because actually you know he, he's not going to be held in good standing if he doesn't. She's not going to be happy with him in in this case. So. Um, so we see that you know the, the autonomy of women, and actually to, we 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 should understand the way in why where that autonomy for women is rooted. Um, it's rooted in the fact that uh, women, women's role in, in, in productive work um, is absolutely central and crucial, really, to, to hunter-gatherer groups. There are differences in emphasis, you know, if you're living in, you know, sort of, uh, where the Inuit are living in very, very cold conditions, uh, hunt, you know, hunting of meat is very, very important. But nonetheless, um, across the world we see um, Women's role in the gathering of nuts, fruits, and berries is, is that the crucial role that they, they, they carry out. And so you do see in these in, in hunter-gatherer societies, we do have a division of labour between men and women based around the fact that, that women um, are the ones that have, have children. Um, it's, a, it's about um, uh, ensuring um, that women can do that uh, in, a, in a safe way and so on. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you have a division of labour between men and women, that that, 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 that that automatically leads to inequality. So that the fact uh, that women are childbearing does not automatically lead to the inequality of women. And many uh, anthropologists um, who, who've studied uh, uh, um, what they call ancient societies have failed to notice what women were doing simply because they, they went there with the assumption that women were, were, were the less important sex and therefore failed to actually notice what the women were actually doing. So, as um, Elena Burke Leacock said, talked about among the Mon uh, Montagna Nescape, uh, she talks about that um, you, the people who made the decisions uh, about things were the people who knew most about it. So, women knew most about the gathering. So, so if they said, well, actually, there isn't enough around here for us to be gathering in anymore, we're moving on, then that was a decision that would be respected. And she, she saw one incident where the, where the women stopped uh, some great ritual that the men were, were in, involved in, probably took days and days, and they said, well, really sorry, you've got to stop now because um, we can't actually gather enough, we're going. Um, and that was respected and agreed to. Um, so, uh, I'm making sure that I've, I'm, I'm mentioning, yes. Um, yeah, so again, we see, we see these things across the world, among the, whether it's you know, from Congo to the Philippines, for the, from the Kalahari Desert to Tanzania, we see these sorts of uh, uh, arrangements. And, I, and this, this arrangement, we should also say, takes place in a situation of um, 
nomadic societies in which it is not possible or very difficult to, uh, to generate a surplus. It's, um, if you're moving around, you're not able to store um, you're not able to store surplus, and therefore these were societies in which uh, the, uh, the sharing uh, is, and cooperation are valued. They had to be, they had to be in order, uh, uh, in order for, 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 for survival. Now, um, the, the machinery, machinery Le Jeune uh, that uh, Eleanor Burke Leacock uh, describes, um, who, who, who also worked among the, the uh, hunter-gatherers uh, in the 17th century, was absolutely appalled by what he found. His diaries are, are very interesting and revealing, uh, and also reveal that there are efforts to, to uh, undermine the equality and the autonomy that, uh, that the women experienced. Um, uh, which was resisted, um, and he challenged, he, he challenged the men, and he saw a man pick up a child that was crying, comfort the child, he said, what are you doing that for? You don't even know that's your child. Um, and, you know, because you, you don't demand obedience and chastity of your women, why not? This is, you know, this is, you, you should be. And, the, you know, the man just turned around and said, well, actually, I think you're a bit stupid, because actually we love all our children. Um, so, um, there's one other thing that I wanted to mention though, um, and that is um, what gets called two-spirit people. Um, and we definitely know about two-spirit people um, from the Native Americans and from uh, the Inuit people. And um, they were, these are people who are seen as destined to live life as the opposite sex. Um, and these were people who were very respected and considered more attuned actually to the spiritual world. So we find, um, uh, men uh, uh, in, uh, among, um, among um, the Native Americans who live and dress as women, wear women's clothing, do, do what's co considered to be women's work, um, and they may <coughs> live with a man, uh, marry a man, and the couple may adopt children. Um, we also find what get called manly-hearted women, uh, and they are also seen as very desirable uh, for marriage to other women. And um, then again, I think just in terms of the flexibility of marriage, I think it's really worth, I mean, I don't even know whether I should call it marriage, but anyway, uh, the flexibility of, of, um, of marriage um, as the Inuits saw them uh, before, before, the, before their, that, that uh, hunter-gatherer system broke down. Um, we find various types of marriage among the Inuit. We find uh, one man and one woman, one man and two women, one woman and two men, a, man, a woman and woman, two men and two women, a man and a man, or any combination of above. And the, we know that these people were, put, you know, uh, people were you know, the two-spirit people were um, were persecuted by by missionaries, and um, I, I think uh, ultimately that tradition was one of the first to be destroyed. Um, now I tried to indicate that I'm not trying to suggest that these societies were some kind of perfect utopia or anything. I am suggesting that they're societies in which um, living was, could be a struggle, um, but that, uh, the, the, uh, but that um, survival of hunter-gatherer bands and groups um, depended on um, uh, cooperation and values of generosity and sharing and the hatred, you know, hatred of arrogance and uh, for, forbidden, you know, mainly forbidding uh, uh, keeping of any sort of, of, of surplus and attempts to really, uh, all sorts of attempts and ideas to, to, to try to enforce that. But then that obviously begs the question then of what happened. How did that change? And again, I think we need to look then at uh, what Engels argued um, in his book. Now, in his book, he, he, he talks, part of what his book is about is the rise of class society and the development of the state. I'm not going to go into that. There's a, another meeting that that's going to, can go into the question of the state. What I want to talk about is how the rise of class society and what Engels talked about, how that affected the, the uh, status of women and, and uh, how, how that happened. So, uh, and in the light of, of what, we, what we know uh, now, and our, Engels' argument was that um, the, the, the rise of class society and the development of, of agriculture towards, uh, from, away from the, the sort of light uh, hoeing that we, uh, and gardening, as we talk about it in the, in the earliest agricultural or horticultural societies, which were actually very uh, effective uh, and useful, you know, fine for women to, to take part in with carrying children and breastfeeding and so on, um, how that changed with the, the development of uh, heavy uh, 
heavy agriculture, and in particular the development of the plough, um, uh, which had to be pulled and controlled by uh, animals, very heavy animals like such as oxen, how that changed the position of, of women in, in, in society, um, um, and uh, irrevocably really, uh, until now, obviously. Um, so, how did that happen? Um, the first sort of early, earliest out horticultural societies, it appears, took place around, uh, uh, started to develop around 10,000, around 10,000 years ago, uh, in response to um, changes in the environment. So, um, with, uh, this first of all took place, for instance, in the Middle East. Um, drier and cooler environment meant it was started, made it more difficult to live by uh, hunting and gathering. And they had to develop, um, forcing them to develop their knowledge of domestic, domesticating plants and animals. But the, the process of doing this, in other words, changing the way in which you're producing, changing, developing your technology and your knowledge of production, uh, had absolutely massive uh, implications for the, the, the development of, uh, for the relationships between people um, uh, and for the, the way changing in the, uh, of society and social relationships. Um, because what, what that meant uh, with the development of, uh, of agriculture was that it meant two things. First of all, that it, 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 it ended nomadic existence, people had to settle down. Um, and uh, secondly, <laughs> thanks. Uh, secondly, <laughs> what it did, um, yeah, they, they don't agree. Um, secondly, what, they did, what it did, um, secondly, ended circuit. Secondly, what it did, uh, I'll say that again, because uh, what it did was um, ending nomadic society, forcing people to settle down, stay in one place. Uh, and what that meant was um, allowing, obviously, the, the um, development of agriculture and development of, of, of um, uh, 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 domesticating animals, it also meant that you could produce a surplus, that's to say more than is immediate, needed immediately by the producers, and allowing you to create a class of pe a group of people, which became a class, uh, who are able to uh, live from that, from that surplus, in other words, not doing production themselves, but doing things like um, being priests, Guarding, uh, guarding the surplus, guarding the surplus grain, and so on. Uh, but also priests, but also armed guarding of 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 of, of the surplus. Um, so, um, so one of the results, one of the very results that happened very soon was the, the uh, was constant war and raiding. What didn't happen immediately was the oppression of women. Um, then that's, uh, as I said, with the early agricultural societies because uh, uh, actually it was quite compatible and actually women maintained uh, a lot of control over production and participate, participants in, participating in, uh, the, uh, in, in, in production uh, uh, for, of, of important uh, uh, food and so on. Um, it did mean the development of inequality, as I hinted. Um, the, it started to end and undermine the prohibition on, um, uh, on uh, 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 storing surpluses rather than sharing in times of scarcity and so on. Um, the, the, the development of, of, of uh, the early agricultural societies also uh, had, an, had great effects on, on uh, groups of bands of uh, society, groups of people nearby. So you, you, we started on a course that we, we couldn't go back on. And the development of horticultural society uh, towards the, the fully-fledged agricultural society, which became a class society, um, took, took place over hundreds, maybe thousands of years. But the first, uh, first class society, the first fully-fledged class society uh, that we know of, uh, uh, rose about around 5,000 years ago. Um, the Egypt of the pharaohs would be one example uh, of that. Um, Engels talks about the ancient Greek and Roman societies. So I want to say two things really about what Engels said about that. First, in, in terms of why did class society end women's oppression? I talked about heavy agriculture and the development of the plough. There's a second point about the development of agricultural societies, and that is that unlike nomadic societies, where there is a low level of uh, uh, the population growth is, is, is low, in an in a, in a, uh, agricultural societies, uh, there is a need for a higher population. Uh, what this means is that the pressure on women to have more children starts to become uh, uh, um, uh, very high. Um, so you, what you have, therefore, is a situation in which um, 
the, the, the operation of, uh, of heavy, of heavy ploughing techniques and other heavy, uh, other heavy work is, is incompatible really with the needs of women, you know, particularly in this low level of uh, technology of course, uh, to, to be able to uh, be sex, you know, successfully pregnant, uh, continue to carry, uh, to, to bear children. Um, and societies that did allow uh, women to, to engage in, in this, sort, uh, this sort of activities would find themselves losing out to societies uh, that that did not. Um, so what that ha so over hundreds, maybe thousands of years, what actually the, the result of all of that was that women started to lose control of the means of production. And as, in the course of the development of a root, what we would call a ruling class, uh, the develop development of class society, uh, women lost out, and, and this is what resulted in the the. Um, the, what uh, Engels called the world historic defeat of the female sex, but there's one other point about this, this that has to be made, and that is the question of property. Uh, in the development of a class society in which uh, the, the production um, is increasingly controlled by the men, in which women are increasingly find themselves pushed out, pushed out of any productive roles and become primarily <coughs> child bearers, that means, as Engels uh, said, that uh, the man uh, starts to take control in the household. He said the man seized the reins in the house and the woman was degraded in thrall, the slave of man's lust, a mere instrument uh, for breeding children, and really the development of what is the genuine uh, patriarchal family, a uh, family of women, children, servants and slaves, uh, headed and controlled uh, by, by a man. And Engels further argues, and this again is borne out, uh, by what we know about uh, now about um, uh, uh, the earliest class societies. He says that as wealth increased, it on the one hand gave the man a more important status in the family uh, as a result of his uh, uh, power really and control over the means of production. It also created a stimulus to utilize this in order to overthrow the traditional order of her inheritance. But this was impossible, Engels goes on to say, as long as descent according to mother right prevailed. It, this had to be overthrown, and it was overthrown. And he says that is the world historic defeat of the female sex. In other words, what was needed in a class society, you see this you know, in, in, with the royal family, it's actually maybe the most obvious today, is the need to keep the wealth concentrated among that small number of people, to stop the wealth getting diluted uh, 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 in, among society. The, the, the new class society wants to control its wealth and keep its wealth among that small number of it, it, it's the small number of people within that class society, and it is this this combination of factors um, that um, that meant that uh, the, the 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 imposition of monogamy on women, and uh, Engels is very clear about this that. Um, he says monogamy was only ever for women. It's never been for men. He then talks also about uh, ancient Greece. And this is the other thing I just do want to say about Engels, because I don't think we can be entirely uncritical of, of Engels uh, in what he writes in this book, and I don't want to suggest that everything about it is, is perfect. Uh, I talked about the need to update uh, some of what he said, but also uh, Engels talks about the examples of uh, the ancient Greek societies. He talks about the 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 the, the real uh, enslavement of women in in uh, uh, the in, in Athens and so on. He also, though, however. Uh, uh, says that the, 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 the oppression of women in, in, uh, in Athens, and, uh, he says, is the, was the reason for what he called um, his, his ideas of, of homosexual love among men, uh, that celebration of homosexual love among men, he said, he, de he called that degrading and a perversion. We do not agree with this. Um, it's perhaps a, a, an an ex example of why we as socialists always have to learn from the class and learn from, from the movement. When, Marx, when Engels was writing this book in 1884, there was already a development of uh, uh, women being part of trade unions, part of fighting back, taking part, very big role in, in mass strikes. Um, and in four years later, of course, the match women in Britain uh, uh, took, when, you know, uh, uh, went on strike in the, the, well, the most important uh, strikes by women. So, where on the other hand, the, the LGBT liberation movement really was in, in, in its infancy at that time. Um, we know, obviously, a rather better than that now. Okay, what do we conclude from that? 
Engels argued that it was the rise of class as society, the specific conditions, historical conditions, the way in which class society first developed that was at the, the root of the first oppression of women. Now, we know that since then, the oppression of women has taken different forms. It takes different form um, for women today. But nonetheless, every class society since has c carried on in its own way, and I think capitalism does as well, in its own way, uh, the oppression of women. That we have not been able to uh, uh, liberate women uh, from, 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 from that oppression that was first, uh, they, they first suffered uh, at, at this point. Um, Engels thought that women's oppression could be wiped out among workers uh, in the 19th century as the, you know, in the ravages of factory life actually um, did un uh, undermine uh, uh, the family, the working class family. Um, well, that wasn't to be. Um, and that, uh, you know, capitalism has, uh, I think, remoulded the oppression of women with a vengeance, I think, with the development of, of the modern uh, uh, family that we see today. And therefore, the point that we have to argue is to go back and say that Eng Engels' argument was that, that the way in which we bring up children has a history. There's nothing natural or normal about, uh, well, there's nothing natural about the, the, the kind of family that, that, we, that we have today. So you know, what I think we would conclude then is that Engels didn't know all the things that we know now, but nonetheless um, he is largely borne out by modern knowledge of anthropology. And uh, so when we talk about the ideas of uh, relate, linking the oppression of women to class and the development of class, what we're saying therefore is that the, the uh, relationships of production, on, and when we talk about the relationships of production, when we talk about the way in which relationships of production that we enter into when we go to work and so on, aren't only, don't end, of course, when we, when we leave work at the end of the day. That the, relation, those, that the relationships of, uh, under, uh, of, of relationships of production affect all sorts of other relationships in society. Um, that's, the, that's the point about the ruling class and the, the, the ideas of the ruling class uh, uh, ruling in, in, all, in uh, uh, the ruling ideas in society being the ideas of, of, of the ruling class. <coughs> Engels had an idea about uh, what he called the individual sex love, he, but he wanted to, uh, he, he, he thought that we, that, you know, the capitalism create, could create um, uh, genuine free monogamy, and you know that's his choice, really. I guess, um, but I think part of what he's he's talking about is the um, the, the the freeing of sexual relationships and the relationships of uh, that we enter into uh, in the course of bringing up the next generation, being freed from economic considerations. And I think that is uh, that is an important point that I think that that, that we that that, uh, uh, that we want to talk about so when we talk about fighting for socialism. <coughs> And take it to the plate and um, the struggle for, for women's liberation within the struggle for socialism. So, we know that women haven't always been oppressed. That means we can envisage a world where women are liberated. And in the modern world, we're also not constrained by the kind of biological considerations that our early ancestors, uh, uh, ancestors were. Um, that women's oppression is rooted and, continu and continued by class society. And that's why we argue that we have to end class society in order to end the oppression of women. And why we say that there's n nothing natural about the oppression of women. There's nothing in the nature of men that means that women have to be oppressed. There's, uh, and there's nothing um, in the nature of women, uh, you know, as the childbearers of society, childbearers, that means that we have to be oppressed. And that's, I think, the importance of the approach that Engels took in terms of looking at in his historical materialist approach. So I think what I would um, want to conclude from that is that uh, is the struggle for socialism absolutely has to take place, uh, has to include the struggle for women's liberation. And the struggle for women's liberation does have to be part of uh, class struggle. Uh, and I think just to end really then with what Engels said, because although <laughs> Some of, I've just said some of what Engels said, you know, we would not, of course, agree with. Um, he does acknowledge this. He says that in a society that's never known the oppression of women, he says this, people will not give care a rap about what we today think they should do. They will establish their own practice and their own public opinion. And so, and I think that that's really where I would, I would, I would like to end at this point, to really uh, open it up to discussion.
Right, there's, there's a couple of details in Engels, I'd just like to, for confirmation as to whether they're still regarded as valid or not. Um, first of all, in, in hunter-gathering society, descent had to be matrilineal because it was not known who was the father of, of any child. There was unrestricted sexuality. Um, the, there, was, there was a growth of, sex, of, of incest taboos for sound biological reasons. Um, and that, so there were greater and greater prohibitions on who you could have sex with depending on how you were related to, to them, reckoning through the female line. The pairing marriage was free, free partnership. Either side could dissolve it. The man went to live with the, the woman's family. Um, the <clears throat> women, yeah, I think the, the sexual division of labor did go back to the earliest period. Women, groups of women uh, were equal or superior because they gathered the, the, the staple diet by hunting and uh, by, by gathering that men produced the occasional luxury of, of meat by hunting in groups as a rule although a tribe might cooperate to drive a mammoth off a cliff or something but um, pregnant and breastfeeding women could not easily creep or run after meat, meat animals so men did that but men were expendable because they, a tribe could survive the deaths of most of its men but not most of, it, of its women a defeated enemy could be either adopted into the tribe or killed and maybe eaten, but could not be enslaved because there was no surplus yet. When animals were no longer hunted but herded, then it became possible and practical to enslave defeated enemies to, 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 to mine the herds. At that stage, men wanted patrilineal descent because they wanted identifiable male heirs to pass their, their wealth onto. So that, that was when that change happened. And um, uh, I think there was something else. But, um, the, you know, it was one other point, but I forgot what it was. But I mean, of all the things I have remembered to summarize, are those still regarded as valid, or is any, does any of that need to be revised? I might come back later if I remember something else. Thanks. <laughs> My name's Lisa and I'm a teacher and, I, and what I find really interesting about the, about the talk was actually the bit at the end where you said about sexism not being innate and I think that's really, really important in terms of um, uh, teaching our young people today because actually that gives us hope that you can fight it and that you can change things, that it's not just something that people are, it, it's actually a way our society is constructed. And I just want to give a little example of something that happened to me the other day in school where I, we were having a discussion about whether boys and girls should be taught together for PE lessons. And we were, I'm an English teacher, we were having a debate about it. And a lot of the girls came up immediately with ideas around insecurity, around body image, and why they didn't want boys to see them in their PE kit, and things like that. And that led to a discussion about the media, about photoshopping, about the pressure that young women are under to look a certain way, unrealistic body image being promoted to them. And it led to a discussion about why this happens, who benefits from that. Um, and they very quickly understood that if that people wanted it, to, the shiny <coughs> magazines they read, there are items that they want to sell. And in order to sell them, they have to make the young women want to buy them. So it was an interesting conversation, but also it showed that women's oppression doesn't just affect women. Because one of the young boys in this discussion turned around and he <coughs> said, I'm a boy. I don't like sport. I don't like football. I don't like the things that boys are supposed to like. Does that make me not a boy? And it showed it showed really clearly, you know, that, that women's oppression doesn't just affect our young um, girls; it affects, you know, our young boys as well. And I think to come back to the point that you were saying, I think it's really, really important that we understand um, where sexism comes from. That it's not just something that's built in and natural and innate, because that gives us an opportunity to challenge it. And I think we have to keep challenging it in our schools and in our workplaces because it comes back again and again and again because it's built into the system. It hasn't been defeated by feminism in the past. You know, um, I think that, that means that the small things that we do to challenge sexism every single day uh, become very, very important. And while we fight for those small things, um, at the same time, we also understand that unless we get rid of capitalism and the system that produces these inequalities, then actually we're not going to get rid of women's oppression either. Yes, Stan Keeble from uh, Labour Party of Marxists. Um, I found that a very interesting story, but I'm a fan of the 
radical anthropology group and uh, Chris Knight and his, um, his book uh, Blood Relations um, about the role of menstruation in, uh, in the origin of, uh, um, well, in the origin of, in the human revolution, really. The, and so, of course, you spoke about um, the counter-revolution, really, you know, primitive communism, but primitive means original rather than being pejorative term. You know, it's, it sounds like, like, like you say, savagery, barbarism, uh, all descriptions in angles of the stages of primitive communism. But that communist society um, is, uh, is rather nice. It's not, uh, you know, savagery and barbarism is a, um, sounds pejorative to us. And uh, so it's really a, a, a misnomer in that sense. But um, the, the paradox is that um, in, in the counter-revolution, you, you used Engel's argument that, uh, that there was, uh, because of agriculture, production, increase in productive uh, capacity means there's a creation of a surplus uh, wealth for the first time, which then can be fought over, then facilitates uh, taking slaves instead of people being so poor that they couldn't possibly exploit each other. You know, if there's no surplus product, no surplus labor uh, to be uh, <coughs> claimed, um, then, then there can't be any class society. society in other words, that, that description, which is part of Engels, is saying that society is so poor that there's no possibility of, there's no wealth to exploit, there's no surplus to exploit. And yet, my understanding of it is the other side, which is also in Engels, you know, that the, the, the society is described as counter-dominance um, culture, you know, where, um, where uh, as you said, the um, arrogance is, is hated, you know, um, if, if any, in a whole together of society, if anyone is uh, above themselves, if they're too, um, too proud or proud of their hunting capacity, for example, then they get, uh, they, they have the piss taken out of them. Um, principally by the women, or by the old, the old women particularly. So that's all, you know, all clear, but the, the, this question of uh, how, you know, if you're talking about a counter-revolution, how this egalitarian, counter-dominance uh, society, of original human society, you could call it, um, which lasted probably 200,000 years, a lot longer than so-called civilization, you know, then the, the other question is, how did it begin? So it was a, a, a counter-revolution that produced so-called civilization, class society. I'll finish quickly, yeah. But there was a revolution called, for anthropologists, called the, the human revolution, when this egalitarian society was created, when the alpha male was overcome. I think that's a very important uh, aspect. That, of course, had something to do with um, menstruation and the, the women actually being in a very powerful position when they were living in conditions of abundance. And that's the question I want to put to you. Um, speak up, you know. um, yeah, of course, we, I, th I think Sorry, that human society up. began in abundance. You know, that's, that's the problem with Engels. We've got two stories there. Yeah. Just a, a little question, really. I don't know if I'm, <laughs> I'm being a bit potty. Um, but when, when they talk about primitive societies and women are always sort of, you know, women were the gatherers and so on, is that always the case? Do we know whether, you know, at times where hunting is presumably a very dangerous thing to engage in, men would get hurt or get killed, there'd be fights sometimes with other <clears throat> groups of people. So sometimes perhaps you wouldn't have enough people to do the hunt. And therefore, women who are probably very strong doing lots of physical things would be perfectly capable of being hunters. So, and the idea then that men would never perhaps gather, I just, that kind of deliberate sort of division between the two, surely it would have been a bit more fluid than that, that everybody would need to chip in as and where, you know, women fought in the, did stuff in the Second World War, worked in munitions, you know, women always sort of were called in when there's a shortage of men, so surely in those times, women as well would have had to perhaps step up and, you know, be doing their bit and actually be perfectly capable of being aggressive and, and working together, so... 
Uh, David Hardman from London Metropolitan University, where uh, I'm a lecturer in psychology uh, and teach evolutionary psychology, amongst other things. Um, this is the second time I've been to uh, uh, this meeting. Uh, this is one of the topics where I, I find I have m more dissent uh, with sort of Marxist views than uh, anything else, although much of the other meetings I, I agree with a lot of things. Um, uh, what I know about anthropology from anthropologists I know uh, is that it's not an entirely united uh, discipline, and I think there are people who would dissent uh, rather from this idea uh, of an egalitarian uh, past where there was uh, no violence and no sexism. Um, I'm not going to go into all the sort of, uh, the sort of reasons for that now, but what the question that I really wanted to ask is about one of the most studied hunter-gatherer groups uh, in, in recent times, uh, because there's a lot of different types of hunter-gatherers, as I think the speaker actually indicated. Uh, we can't say that they are all uh, the same. Um, but one of the sort of best known is uh, the Yanomama, uh, which was studied uh, by a guy called Napoleon Chagnon, who got into terrible trouble uh, with um, Marxist anthropologists. Uh, and uh, there was actually uh, an inquiry by the American Anthropological Association, which uh, eventually exonerated him of various accusations that were made against him. But he studied the Anamama, uh, one of the uh, best known hunter-gatherer tribes, and he concluded that um, uh, there was a, a, a very high level of violence in their society, including what he described uh, as uh, occasional war. Um, and also he said that they were uh, terribly sexist. Uh, so I'd be interested to know actually what uh, uh, the speaker uh, thinks about uh, his studies. Um, this is sort of more to do with the modern class system, um, but I sort of thought of it because when Lisa was mentioning school and work, uh, a bit cynical about the way women are taught in school and work and men as well can influence their views on sexism. I think uh, the way women and men view sexism has a lot to do with their socio-economic background. Uh, I think women from working class backgrounds may feel and perceive sexism in a stronger way and that some women, I feel all women do experience sexism, but if you're a more upper middle class to upper class woman, you may feel and experience sexism in a different way to the point where in your, if you're in a certain position you may feel that sexism isn't so bad in this society. And I've experienced it a lot in my own school with some women saying they don't believe sexism is an issue and they don't view feminism, mainly because they haven't experienced sexism themselves. Uh, with teaching sexism um, in school, uh, there's only so much you can teach in school and work. If you don't see sexism in your own society, you can feel that like it's not an issue. Uh, yeah, I think the key issue in this debate is really how it helps us to fight sexism, how it helps us to fight the arguments about the inevitability of sexism. But I want to come back to a few of the technical points that were raised. Firstly, I begin to think we should ought to be talking about gatherer hunter societies, <coughs> because actually whilst these societies vary quite widely, but I'll talk about that in a second, actually most of these societies, actually gathering is more important to the economic survival of, of the tribe uh, than is the hunting. Um, it's also true, of course, that women often did hunting, non-nursing women often did do the hunting, but I think we also have to be careful because it depends on the particular circumstances. Each of these societies uh, are, you know, had their own conditions, climatic conditions, conditions in terms of the food that was available, etc., etc. So you actually have to do the work of analysing the way these societies go. So I want to pick up the question of the Anamami and indeed some uh, claims of Aboriginal societies. Some Gentile, sorry, I'll use the word Gentile, Gens is the term that uh, Lewis Henry Morgan uses and the Engels uses, what we would probably call a clan. <coughs> Gentile structures can dis disintegrate for a whole series of reasons. Um, colonialism, conflict with other uh, more developed groups, for example, in, the, in Mesoamerica, it was conflict with the class societies of the Aztecs and the Mayas that caused the, the that caused the collapse. But actually extreme resource stress, extreme uh, hunger can cause the collapse of Gentile structures. Um, 
and I think that's, uh, and I think in those societies you do see behaviour that you wouldn't see in those that are more prosperous. By the way, in most of these societies, actually they have plenty of food. Plenty and surplus are different. But if your plenty is based on mangoes in a hot country, actually the mangoes don't last long, so you can't be accumulated, uh, accumulated um, as a surplus. I do want to say one or two things though, actually about the process of development. What's interesting, <laughs> so let's so say something about Gentile society. If you read more, Lewis Henry Morgan, he talk, a whole range of stuff he talks about. For example, the word for mother in the Iroquois is actually applies to all women of your mother's generation. Right? Now this is actually, you think outside, you know, when you begin to think about a society that operates like that, then actually the, 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 the meeting of the, of, the, of the gens and then on of the tribe actually is the determining power. The majority of people there are the women. The, you know, most of these groups are exonomous. You marry out of your gens into another gens. So as the man, you go elsewhere, you go to your mothers. Um, just want to make one of the... So actually you have to get your head into a whole different way of seeing the family. Because it isn't the family in the way we know it. When you read this stuff, it's fantastic. But what, I just want to make one final brief point. I won't go on a little bit. Actually, if you look at the process by which these societies collapse, whether it's collapse of the Greek gens, you go from matrilineal to patrilineal as surplus begins to develop, as uh, property begins to develop. And actually, you can see this either in when Malinowski's descriptions of the Trobri and Islanders, you can see it in Anthony's description of the steppe culture in Central Asia, and you can see it in Egypt, etc., etc. What is interesting is that despite the different conditions under which these societies exist, actually the process by which they transform into class societies and the, and the uh, uh, d d decline of the status of women is, women is common to all. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I um, wanted to come back very quickly about um, the, the person who talked about how uh, there must have been women who were hunting and men gathering. And I think it's, it, it goes back to what Celia was saying about how uh, gender was very different in these societies, that two-spirit was very common, the gender variation was very common. And then we have to remember a lot of the information we have about these societies written down is through a modern idea of gender. So they saw people and said, well, these are the men and these are the women. That might not have been how they identified or even how they may have been able to be boxed biologically and even under modern standards. That's how they were split by our academics, you know, going back a little bit. So it's, it's, it's really not as simple as that. I mean, yes, of course, there would have been people we would have called women today who would have been physically better for hunting, you know, because for gathering, that's much better if you're pregnant or disabled or a little older. And that is regardless of gender. But it's because we're looking at this through a new lens that we end up getting these kind of boxes when we talk about it, we can't help that. That's how we got this information, and we have to deconstruct it as we go. Um, I was really glad to hear that, looking into that a little bit, I mean, it was very interesting that one of the first things um, they tried to do when they were colonialising these societies is they got rid of the gender variant people first, and quite brutally, because it's a lot easier to start putting in rigid gender boxes and rigid gender roles when you don't have the most obvious gender variant people to begin with, and they did that with a lot of brutality, for a reason. And it, it, it all comes back to how you're playing today. I mean, it also meant a lot because these people tended to be of a more religious background. It then threatened the religions of these societies and the cultures, and it chips. But, so it's one of them, you know, we, we have to be careful when we do look back that we don't always put our own modern perspective of these things directly on it. Yes, we're limited by the information we have, but we do have to be just critical when it comes to at least the language of it, of how that really worked in those societies. Just a short question about wars. Is war a phenomenon of class societies, or were there already wars amongst these hunters and gatherers about hunting grounds, let's say? And um, I've read somewhere that even apes sometimes have wars amongst each other, so that's my question. Um, come right over here. Um, firstly, thank you for that really interesting talk. And 
to everyone else for the really interesting points raised. Um, I had two questions. One was linked in with what the comrade at the front said here. And it was, um, is there a danger of um, perhaps romanticising some of these anthropological histories that we read? Is there a danger of doing, I guess, what we call in colonial studies, um, Orientalism? Uh, so do we have to be quite sceptical when we look back and quite critical um, of, of those histories? My other question is a much wider one, which I'm guessing will not be settled today if we ever settle it. Um, but it's whether you can fight um, sexism without simultaneously um, also fighting other forms of inequality like classism or elitism and racism. Um, my experience, um, I'm a feminist activist and a, a lawyer, but my experience has been that sometimes we prioritise the fight against some inequalities above others. But um, I know intersectionality is a very trendy term now, but is that still not relevant? Do we not need to fight inequality on all planes at the same time? Thank you. I guess um, a, a couple of points. I think that last question has just thrown lots of new things into my head as I was getting up there. Um, and I think that, yeah, okay, so two points. One was I saw a, a very interesting film that that's ca just came out a couple of weeks ago called Embrace of the Serpent, which is about... Uh, a kind of colonialist going into um, Amazonian Colombia in like 1909 and then about 30 years later. So it's like two journeys with the same indigenous person who's guiding first a German anthropologist and then an American scientist um, looking for this particular like so-called magical plant that has all these properties that the colonialists want for various reasons. Um, it doesn't particularly shed light in terms of, of women's oppression in, in that society, but obviously it's set in 1909 at the time where Spanish colonialism has just ripped apart those societies uh, of living, really living in the jungle, living in plenty in the sense of that there's lots of stuff they haven't had to start cultivating things because there's, there's never a lack of, of food and resources. Um, what is really interesting that the film shows, I think, really well is the way that uh, the attitudes being brought from the West are imposed then on those societies um, and, and clash really badly. So there's a good bit where the German anthropologist is desperately hungry, he jumps into the Amazon, grabs a fish and starts eating it, and the, the indigenous guy is really angry because he's saying, hey, we don't eat fish until the so-and-so plant flowers or whatever. And there's all, all these kind of restrictions on what you're allowed to do at particular times of the year, precisely because they're trying to work in in harmony with how you know the the environment works when the fish is breeding season is etc etc and you can see that even though there there is apparently plenty there's loads of fish in the sea the german guy is like what do you mean i can't have a fish there's loads of fish here we're never going to run out but of course 100 years on we know that it's very easy to run out of fish if you overfish and you don't think about how how things reproduce etc i would I don't know how widely available it is, but I would really recommend watching that. The other thing is just about how, why Engels wrote the book at the time he did, because I think if we think about the time he was living in, we would call it the Victorian era here, he's in Germany, um, it's the time precisely in the 1880s when the, the kind of bourgeois ideal of the family is being imposed so strongly onto society anew, a society which has just gone through, and Germany is slightly behind Britain, I guess, in this, uh, you know, the Industrial Revolution, and the ripping up of all the ways that people were living uh, on the land as peasants, etc., throwing them into cities, into factories, and then into these new box houses that have been thrown up around cities and around the factories to live in this kind of nuclear family way, and the, all the kind of morality that went alongside that. So I think even though there are all <coughs> kinds of things that are, you know, that are questionable, as, as Celia has said, and as other people have, have questioned, I think that what Engels was doing was, number one, saying sexism is not inevitable, and number two, saying that oppression is linked into how, how our society produces, how we create the things that we need and how we organise ourselves to do that. And so I think for him, I think we're talking about the origins of women's oppression specifically, but I think that actually the way that Engels approaches it is precisely to say that all of those divisions in society, all of those oppressions, whether it is racism, the rise of the state, of course, relates very much to the rise of uh, you know national oppression of racism of all those kind of ideas that uh, ideologies that become so the root of other oppressions and I think this the, you know the, his method in in the argument is about tying all of those things in in and precisely saying that we have to we have to fight all of these things together because they're all rooted in the same problem. So um, thank you everyone for a really interesting discussion. So um, Celia. Okay, um, thanks everybody, that was really, really interesting. Um, okay, 
Um, I just want to address the first question first, actually, because um, I think we need to be very clear about what Engels was saying, what he wasn't saying, what we agree with, and what we don't. Um, so, was he talking about matrilineal descent? Yes, he was. That's what he was talking about, the idea that the child, uh, the child's descent, any person's descent, is to reckon through who their mother is, not who their father is in, in uh, hunter-gatherer societies, largely. Um, for many, well, partly because of women's autonomy and, and importance in society, and also because, because uh, following from that, because women, um, because therefore you couldn't couldn't be cer certain who the father was. This didn't bother people. This was fine uh, in hunter-gatherer societies. Uh, yes, uh, unrestricted sex. I think that we, what we had was all sorts of, in different societies, different groups, um, all sorts of ideas and customs around uh, sexual practice, um, but it didn't include enforcement of monogamy on anyone. That we know in, in pretty much any hunter-gatherer society. Uh, it did include free separation uh, initiated by either, either party. Uh, I was about to say well, either men or women, but then I described all sorts of marriages that were, didn't quite fit that, that, quit, fit that I idea. Um, questions about incest taboo and issues like that. That, has been, that was Morgan's idea. Um, his arguments about that have been questioned, and I think that we would want to, uh, want to be updating some of that in terms of those sorts of ideas. I wouldn't take those, those sorts of parts of that Engels writes as, as, as uh, strictly, uh, strictly uh, accurate. Um, so, yes, a um, lot of pairing marriage, but also with the rider that I've just mentioned. Um, yeah, so on the, the sexual division of labour, um, it's amazing, actually, when you do look across, look at different societies, hunter-gatherer societies around the world, um, lots of differences and variations according to particular environment, but also so many things, so much in common. Um, and a lot of, so the, the division of labor of hunting and gathering is one of those things that is really very, very consistent across hunter-gatherer societies. However, there is flexibility even in that. It's not just about the, 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 uh, the manly-hearted women and the two-spirited people and so on, um, but it's also, for instance, uh, um, as uh, Eleanor Burt Leacott observed in the, among the hunter, N M Montana Nascapi, she talked about the division of labor between particular very skilled work that you had to really learn and learn and be very, very good at, the men making canoes and the women working skins and so on. Um, but she also said that yes, hunting was largely uh, seen as what men did, but she also described situations in which women and children did take part in helping with the hunt. So there is not, so there is flexibility there. It's not some cut and dried, you know, you women, you will not take part in the hunt and so on. Um, Cannibalism, there's a lot of arguments about cannibalism. Uh, I, won't, I won't go into those. Um, and finally, the question of identifiable heirs. Absolutely, identifiable uh, male heirs uh, and the whole question of the control, um, the, the control uh, under the, the first class societies of women's sexuality and the control of the inheritance of property and making sure that the, the surplus, the wealth, that is being accumulated stays within a small number of people, stays within the families. To, you know, actually, to, as we, you know, we now know, to such an extent that actually sometimes you look at the you know, pharaoh societies, it starts to undermine the incest taboo. You know, poor old King Tutankhamun, you know, poor chap, he, was, he really suffered from as a result of being a result of incestuous uh, uh, marriages and so on. Um, you know, trying to keep uh, the small number of people, um, uh, but also. The key fact with the development of, uh, of agriculture was that it wasn't only the very richest women that were excluded from that production. The point is that uh, uh, it, the, you know, women across society were started to be excluded from production and excluded uh, uh, from, therefore, key decision-making in production. And that was the point. That was, that, was, that was why it was possible, therefore, to overthrow the, the, the female sex. Um, so 
uh, and so I think um, one of the things, therefore, that class society did was to break up the old kinship matrilineal uh, women's descent systems uh, in, uh, as, as a result of the rise of the state and therefore the development of legal codes and forms of government, which completely destroyed those old kinship systems. I, I, I base some of what I talked about today on a book called The Creation of Inequality. Um, and uh, they make various arguments about clans and so on as well and argue that um, not all, not all uh, hunter-gatherer societies uh, were clan-based. Um, is there no violence in, um, uh, uh, in hunter-gatherer societies? Well, I wouldn't say that. We don't say that. What we do say is that there wasn't systematic war. There was not systematic warfare. Uh, as that we do find when we get to the early agricultural societies. But the other thing I think we do have to be aware of, and Eleanor Burke Leacock is very, very good on this, uh, is that she points out that you, when you look at, uh, at what seems to be a hunter-gatherer society, you really have to take into consideration what has been the effect of modern society on those people. Um, and so. Uh, there's virtually no hunter-gatherer society today, I think, that has, is unaffected by, my, by modern society. And this is the care that we have to take when we think about when, it, what hunter-gatherer societies uh, were, were really like. Um, so I really, therefore, want to come back to uh, Engel's method and the, um, what we draw from it today. Um, and I want to just come back to this question about, are we saying that we prioritise class struggle over any kind of uh, struggles over oppression. And that's not, and I think what I want to say about that is that's not really what the argument is. The argument starts by saying that it is class society that is at the, the development of class society is at the root of the oppression of women in particular, um, and that therefore in order to end the oppression of women, we do have to end class society. So when we talk about women and class today, we, we, we recognise, of course, that women are divided by class, that therefore, you know, as women today, I think that we would all agree that women, I certainly haven't got anything in common with Theresa May, for example. Um, I am not going to unite with Theresa May against the oppression of women because I don't think Theresa May has any interest in uniting with me. Uh, she may be oppressed, she may experience sexism, but as somebody said, I think that her experience of sexism is a great deal uh, less sharp and extreme than all of us women in this room. Um, and uh, so I am not going to unite with Theresa May. I'm much more interested in actually uniting with all of the people like us in this room together to say that we do not believe that the, the oppression of women is in the interests of anyone of, of either men or women, if people talked about, somebody talked about, you know, why should men have to feel like you have to be, you know, really fascinated by football uh, and macho and never cry and all of these sorts of things, um, that nobody benefits the, from the oppression of women and we all benefit from the unity that we can get as a, through our class struggle uh, in fighting back against austerity in the modern society. So, so this, that's really the argument. It's not about saying class is more important than uh, 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 oppression of women or racism or any of these things. It's saying that in order to overcome these things, it has to be part of a class struggle. That we're, uh, um, and that's really, I think, that what we would draw from, from, from uh, um, what we learn from Engels and Engels' work um, is that, the, that we understand that the, 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 um, the relationships that we enter into and also the ideas ideas that we have and also our sense of ourselves, our sense of identity, as I talked about the Two Spirits people and Comrade here talked about I think very, very well, um, is absolutely rooted in our material conditions, the material conditions in which we live. And that's, so that's, that's what we want to do as revolutionary socialists. We want to completely overthrow the, the material conditions of capitalism, which be, um, benefit only a tiny minority of people. Um, and therefore, our, our, our central argument is that the, in order to win women's liberation, we have, that has to be part of the struggle for, for, for socialism.